God bless each and every one of you for tuning in this morning all over the world. Hallelujah. And uh, I'm going to be continuing what I began Friday evening talking about an open heaven. And uh, we started in Matthew chapter 11 talking about the kingdom of heaven since the time of John, which was only two years since the time of John. Uh, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. Now most people think that th that's an attack on the people of God, but it's not. It's the kingdom of God advancing forcibly. The kingdom of heaven suffereth the violence, and the violent take it by yes. force. So people that are uh, newly into this kingdom, the law and the prophets prophesied until John that was the law of dispensation, but with John the Baptist and, of course, the Lord Jesus came, the beginning of the grace of God, and people were pouring into it. What that means, the violent take it by force. They crowd themselves into it. Yes. And that has to be in our hearts. Because in these last days, glory to Jesus, God is going to have a remnant of people who know how to have an open heaven, not only over them, their household, their city, but personally, each one of us needs to know how to bring forth an open heaven in our life. Amen. So we're not having to depend on anybody else for anything. Amen. <clears throat> so many of us depend on a worship leader to get us in or uh, whatever and uh, or some church system to do it but I think God is separating us from everything to do with Babylon in That's this right. last hour and uh, so this morning I'm going to take you know I, I taught on this many times and I haven't even begun the seven or eight scriptures that I usually talk about because so much is opening up about it here in Job chapter 2, and I want to talk to you this morning about how the remnant of God, that is, who do I mean by the remnant? I mean the chosen, devoted disciples, disciples that have chosen of their own free will to devote their lives to Jesus 24 hours a day. <clears throat> and I use myself as an example. You know, I'm 66. And was and uh, am happily married to my wife and family, but the Lord visited me. Uh, I guess what was it a year or so ago, Andrew? And uh, <clears throat> just I was getting ready for a night meeting, and uh, all of a sudden, in the I was here in Jacksonville, the boiling hot uh, afternoon, and this wind began to blow on me, and out of that wind came a voice saying, Samuel, my son, I want you to come back to Jacksonville because I want you to be here as you were in the beginning. I was here in 1971 <clears throat> for the beginning of the charismatic move here. I want you to return. And at 66, and knowing that my wife and I were purchasing property in Asheville, uh, <clears throat> I kept it to myself and didn't want to say anything about it. Uh, and then I tell you, I happened to be in the same place four months later, three months or four months later, and the same thing happened again. A supernatural wind began. I mean, it was like a rushing, mighty wind. And as it blew over me, the voice spoke out of that wind like he did to Elijah that day and repeated to me that he wanted me here for the last great move of God and that I was to establish home meetings all over this area and appoint my sons and daughters to take over these uh, <clears throat> little home meetings so that they can start doing the ministry and stop waiting for some church to invite them to come. And uh, so just, you know, and everybody we've trained pretty much can do worship and uh, preach, teach, counsel, they're masters of uh, everything. What is that? How does that say? A jack of all trades and masters of none. In our case, we're jacks of every kind of ministry and masters of everything. 
Whatever gift is needed at the moment, I believe, if you're properly trained in the ministry and have a deep and abiding foundation, you then can minister uh, whatever God has called you to do. But uh, So I want us to look this morning, beginning in Joel chapter 2, and see how the remnant, and I'm going to be talking about the key of David this morning, yeah. okay, and how that that key is given to the remnant in these last days. Thank you. So here in Joel chapter 2, we all know this. This is the story of the army of God that comes out of nowhere. He says as we read it, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Now, you and I are living in the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is as a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. But hear me, we have slipped from the sixth day into the beginning stages of the seventh day, the day of the Lord. And I'm telling you, six is the number for man and Satan. And I tell you, such foolishness has taken place in this last sixth day. It's like the seven churches. You know, the sixth church was the uh, Philadelphian church, but the seventh church was the Laodicean church. And that seventh church, Laodicea means democracy or of the people. No longer is God the author of his own church. No longer can we trust the men and women of God over us that they've actually heard from the Lord. Particularly during this pandemic, I haven't heard, you know, so many people have been prophesying whether to vote for Trump or to vote for somebody else, and they've gotten caught up in all kinds of worldliness, caught up in all kinds of foolishness, but God, in these precious last hours of the sixth day, as we're moving into the seventh, there is time yet, and that's the call of God upon my life and upon all the sheep in Narrowway Ministries to let everyone know that all the hell they've been through the last few years, God was using it for a purpose in our lives. Can you say amen to yeah. that? Amen. All right. And so uh, we see now in this day of the Lord, what is it? It's a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness. Has there ever been a time on this earth? I'm 66. I've never lived through a more wicked time in my life. Anything goes now. Matter of fact, they're trying to force the church into accepting things that they've never accepted before. Yeah. And we have to stand strong and teach what the Bible says. We're not against anybody that's gay. Uh, we're not against anybody that's... Uh, you know, struggling with their gender. But when you try to force those rules on people and force uh, the, the body of Christ and say that we're, we're intolerant and that we're racist is just not true. Because the Bible is very clear, both in the Old and New Testament, that God has a word about homosexuality. He loves the people, but he hates the sin calls it an abomination and uh, we have people that are very close to us extremely close to us that have now come out and said that they were gay we love them we do everything we can to stand with them to help them and support them but only as they walk with Jesus I know that may sound strong but I'm telling you, let your yea be yea, That's right. and your nay be nay. Amen. This is a day of darkness. This is a day of Sodom and Gomorrah. These are the end times. And all you have to do is read uh, 2 Timothy 3 
and uh, realize that these are demonizing times shall come. Perilous times have come. And the body of Christ to this point has not had an answer. And it's not in taking people to church anymore. It's not in any of that foolishness, wrapping ourselves in the ornaments of religion, you know, turning the lights down. Where did that come from? So that the atmosphere, the Holy Ghost sets the atmosphere in every meeting. And anybody worth their salt in God that has an anointing brings with them the light of God. We don't need a special lighting and, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, video screens with r rivers flowing and, you know, all fountains and waterfalls, all that stuff. Yeah. And then the smoke, putting smoke into worship services. It would be, it would be really kind of uh, foolish if it wasn't the truth. But the real disciples, the developed disciples. What does disciple mean in the Greek? It means a student of the word. Yeah. Someone that actually is participating in the discipline of God. So in the midst of all this, Job says, As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like. Wow. Glory to Jesus. Amen. Nobody has ever seen what God is about to bring forth. Many people have talked about it, prophesied of it. I've known I've preached it for years, more than 30 years. But I really believe, after everything I personally have gone through in the last uh, five, seven years of my life, two strokes, two heart attacks, you know, loss of all kinds, in every way, shape, and form, that God has been preparing this last great Yes. remnant Amen. of sons Jesus. to walk in perfection. Let us go on to perfection. Paul said, be perfect, Jesus said, as I am perfect. Be holy as I am holy. It's not about going to heaven. It's not about attending a church. It's not about pastoring a church for thousands of people. It's about being changed into the image Amen. of Christ Jesus. Amen. That's what it's all about. Yeah. And the only way for yeah, that to happen is discipleship. Every yes. single person needs to have a relationship with a pastor or a father in the Lord because those relationships are going to be vital because Babylon is falling. No more Methodist, Episcopalian, Presbyterian, you know, who have super assemblies of God that have superintendents over towns and they appoint people. No. It's going to be relationships, knowing the man of God and woman of God over your life, and them knowing you, and then setting you into a place of ministry where God is going to mightily use you. But there, this, there's never been the like of these people. Neither shall there be any more after it even to the years of many generations. Yes. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them. In other words, they're walking in everything that Adam walked in. Yeah. Everything before the fall has been restored to these people, if you can believe it. And some people, they say, well, that's just too much for me. Well, it's been too much for me for over 50 years that I walk with Jesus. But I'm telling you, I believe it's something that every one of us has to press into. Amen. We're not pressing into mediocrity. We're pressing in to the character of God. There's nothing mediocre about the character of God. But there's everything, power, 
filled with power, filled with his character, his righteousness, his holiness. No more uh, roller coaster rides in our walk with God. The mountains are coming down and the hills uh, are, or the valleys are coming up and there's going to be an even straight place for us to walk across Jesus. if we've allowed God to deal with us, to humble us, to break us. So many people are against that and the body of Christ knows so little about suffering. But he's making the rough places plain. Why? So that the glory of the Lord can be revealed yeah. in this earth. The only way the glory is going to be seen is in a people. Yeah. A holy people. Yeah. That have the image of Jesus in them. And behind them is a desolate wilderness, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble. In other words, when these people show up, they're so full of the glory as Peter was that day in Acts 16. When his shadow, and what does that mean? The shadow of Peter fell upon people. It says it, what that means in the Greek is in, he was enveloped in a haze of glory. Jesus. And I believe and I've wanted it my whole life. I've cried out. I've preached it all over the world. To be enveloped in a haze of glory. God's people are going to be so full of the glory of God. That's their calling. God's going to reveal his true character, his true anointing, his true power through sons and daughters that have allowed him to work in their lives over the last 25, 30 years, however long you've been in. For me, it's over 50. But I can tell you, I'm closer now than I've ever been in my life. Hallelujah. But at the same time, I've gone through more in these last four years than I've been through the whole 40 years or 45 years before that. Why? Because we're getting closer <coughs> to the revelation of God's glory in a people. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Yes. And men shall come to the brightness mm -hmm. of thy rising. Spirit, soul, and body, we're going to be consumed with the glory of God. And most people just do not want to give their lives. They give their lives to a point. Their spirits, yes, your spirit's already saved. Your souls are being saved and your body is yet to be saved. That's our threefold salvation, all included in that one salvation. But so many times when God begins to work on our soul, that corrupted place where we've inherited things from our parents and the iniquities, that means crooked, perverse, is passed down. And there's some things in our life we don't even want to be there. We don't know how they got Amen. there. We were born with them. They passed down through our family. Jesus. God wants to deal with those iniquities. Thank you. So what happened? How does he do it? What does Isaiah 4 say? Let's look there. Let me just read it to you real quick. Isaiah chapter 4. And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion. In other words, that sounds like a lot of people 
are going to be leaving Zion. What is Zion? Yes, it's a place in Jerusalem. It's a mountain. But guess what? It's also a kingdom of people that have a revelation as they worship of God being appearing the Shekinah glory of God coming down between the two cherubim above the mercy seat and that's where he said you will meet with me I'll meet with you there that is Zion in particular so it seems many people are leaving Zion he that's left in Zion and he that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called what holy holy holiness is not a dream anymore it is a reality for those of us that have been giving our lives every day to the Lord for all of our life for these years and I say to you today if you have not been doing that check yourself and turn and embrace the dealings of God they shall be called holy everyone that is written among the living not the dead in Jerusalem when when is this going to happen when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion did you know there's filth in Zion glory to God and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by what the spirit of judgment oh, thank you, and Lord. the spirit of burning these two things the spirit of judgment what does that mean judgment means a decision rendered that's all it means so judgment can be for the good or it can be for the bad depending upon what you're doing in your life God judges your life so that you know that's good or that's bad and then to help you get, a, get rid of all the bad things, the spirit of burning comes to wash it out. <clears throat> I personally don't believe uh, that God's fire is natural. In the Old Testament, yes, God used fire as a natural principle. But as a rule, the Bible speaks <clears throat> very clearly that fire is a spiritual substance yeah and the only thing it burns is the garbage and darkness That's right. and thank filth you in Lord lives. thank you father glory to Jesus all right well we could just go on reading down there in Isaiah 4 and it would be absolutely wonderful but let's go back to Job chapter 2 So you see, as they come, there's a flaming fire burning before them. Doesn't this sound like the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11? Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're all combined. The two witnesses are simply a company of Gentile believers and a company of Messianic believers. Mm-hmm. That's the two witnesses. There aren't two people. It's two companies of people. But as they come... They bring the fire of God. They're so full of the glory. It just blows everybody away. And then behind them, what does it say? Uh, They leave behind a desolate wilderness. Either you're going to be burnt by the glory of God and made pure and holy, or you're going to quit and give up and be a desolate wilderness. But nobody's going to be able to make, uh, you're going to have to make a decision. And that's why I believe God has sent me back again to find the remnant in this city that I love so much. And I've spent 20, over 20 years here at different points, five times or five years here and then went away to pastor three years again and then went away to pastor and then came back and pastored for 20 years. But God loves this city and the surrounding cities. He loves your city. And he loves your nation wherever you are. And he's calling you 
to holiness. For without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Yeah. And holiness is not a do or don't thing. It begins in the heart. The only way you're going to change people on the outward appearance is changing their hearts. And so we have to be purged by the spirit of burning, not physical fire, but Holy Ghost fire that burns out of us all of the things that we really don't want there. All right, moving on here now. <clears throat> Before their face, the people shall be much pained, and all faces shall gather sorrow or blackness. When people see this remnant beginning to come forth, you know what it's going to do? It's going to remind all of those people, and we know thousands of them. Personally, I know and have met thousands of yeah. people who were called to be in the remnant that are now not walking with the Lord. They're not, in other words, they're, they've got a relationship with Jesus, but they're not pressing towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And so what happens when they see people that are actually entering in? One of two things is going to happen. One, they'll either become godly, jealous, and want to be like them, or they will begin to be hateful and justifying themselves and then accuse those people of all manner of darkness just so they can be at peace with themselves and walk every day without being condemned. God doesn't want to condemn anybody he came not in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The Lord is speaking to every one of you this morning. He spoke to myself. I've been up since four o'clock. He's been speaking to me, ministering to me. I'm all alone now. I'm 66. I have nothing. I live in a little one-bedroom apartment. I have a candle, a table, a bed, and a stool, as Elisha did or Elijah, rather. That was Elisha, wasn't it? Yeah. It's exactly what I've wanted for years. All of us have responsibilities and cares. I've raised two families. Hallelujah. But they're all grown up now. And when God set me and called me to do it, was I afraid? Yes. I was afraid to do it physically because of my physical body. Am I lonely? Yes, very much so. But God's given me back what I had so many oh. years ago. I'm able to spend all day with Jesus now, all day in his word oh, without yeah. distraction of dogs, plural, and cats, plural, and children, plural and my beautiful, loving wife. I've gone back to having to fix food for myself. Now, I'm not trying to make you feel sorry for me or anything like that. All I'm saying is I believe God is going to give every one of us an opportunity to walk wholly before Him. Amen. To walk completely utterly consumed with him. Yeah. Please hear me this morning. Do not be offended. God doesn't want you offended. He wants your heart to be pricked today. Then they shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall march every one on his way, and they shall not break rank. Mm -hmm. How many times have we seen in the body of Christ the wrestling matches for positions, ambitious people trying to push people out of the way? All of that has been dealt with 
in the sons of God, in this army of God. Neither shall they thrust one another. They shall walk everyone in his path. Glory to God. Amen. Every one of us has a call and a distinct path from God, and we don't want to be doing somebody else's. That's right. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall, sword, they shall not be wounded. Now, that sounds like the two witnesses to me. The only thing that the two witnesses is they lay down their lives. Nothing, nobody can hurt them. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in the windows like a thief. The earth, watch this now. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. Amen. Now that word for tremble there means undulating or a quaking, a shaking, or moving. So this army knows how to move the heavens yeah, above us. Glory to God. The heavens shall tremble before them. Why? Because I'll tell you real quickly here. Uh, too much time has gone by. I need to hurry up. Because they have the key. Yeah. The key of David. Didn't Jesus say in Matthew, what is it? Uh, is it 16 or 13? I give you the keys of the kingdom. Glory to God. Yes, it's Matthew 16. I give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatsoever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Doesn't that sound like when we pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will oh, be done on you, earth Jesus. as it is in thank heaven? You, Isn't that the reality we want in this life? Yes, yes, yes. These sons of God are going to bring that reality to the earth. <clears throat> They're going to bind on earth and it's bound in heaven they're going to loose on earth and it'll be loosed in heaven because god trusts them god knows them <clears throat> does god know you intimately my 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 what did he say in Luke 13. Let's look there briefly. Hold your place there in Joel chapter 2 and look at Luke 13. And while you're turning to Luke 13, I'm going to finish up here in Joel and just point out the other uh, few passages that talk about uh, uh, the heavens being opened by these people. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens, the heavens shall tremble. Now look in Joel chapter 3. Well, let me just read it to you, verse 16. Oh, my God, my God. Uh, maybe you ought to turn there. Now, this is a three-finger revelation. What was the, the one you just did? You just quoted that was Joel chapter 2. <clears throat> but then in, I'm going to Joel chapter 3. I want you to look with me in verse uh, 9. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles, which means the nations. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. If you're a mighty man or woman this morning, wake up. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. 
Let the weak say, I am strong. <clears throat> I want you to know that we sing that and that song, Give Thanks, and I think he took it out of uh, Joel here, but it doesn't mean what you think it means. In the last days, some of us are going to be so insecure and, you know, all of those feelings of not measuring up, not good enough, and not being strong enough is not going to fly anymore. Amen. Let every weak person say, I'm strong in Jesus. Amen. Yes. And the plowshare that I've used for the last 20 years of plowing and, and planting and things growing and the pruning hooks, they're going to be turned into swords and to spears. Why? Because the day of war there is at hand. Assemble yourselves and come, all you heathen. Gather yourselves together round about. Cause the mighty ones, to, thy mighty ones, to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat. You know what the valley of Jehoshaphat literally means? The Lord judges. It's the valley of judgment. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put you in the sickle for the harvest. Yes. These yes, are the yes. end times. The harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full, the vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes, where? In the valley of decision. That word decision there means judgment. There are numbers upon numbers of people, both within the body and outside of the body of Christ, that are in the valley of judgment. For the day of the Lord, what is that? That's the last day. That's the seventh day. Or the fourth day from Jesus. is near in the valley of decision. Watch this. The sun and moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar, how? Out of Zion. He's going to roar out of his people, Zion, yeah. and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. That word shake is the same word for tremble in Job chapter 2. They're going to be undulating. They're going to be, you know, get about ready to break loose. But no matter what, the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Amen. So shall you know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain, then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers pass through her any more. And it shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine, the hills shall flow with milk, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters, and a fountain shall come forth of the house of the Lord, and shall water the valley of Shittim. What is that? Yeah. It's the valley of flesh. The heavens are going to be opened by these sons of God and God is going to release whatever is necessary. Oil, wine, water, whatever you need to wipe out the flesh Amen. in our lives. Amen. Glory to Jesus. Yeah. Now over here in Luke 13. Hmm. Well, I'm, I'm probably going to have to come back to this because I, I do want us to look. I'll give you the reference here since I took you here and you've been waiting there patiently for a long time. <laughs> Luke 13, 22. 
And he went through the cities and villages teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. Do you know that's where all of us are journeying towards? Amen. What is Jerusalem? Jerusalem is the city of God. It's called in the book of Revelations, what? The new Jerusalem is the bride of Christ coming down from God out of heaven. We're all journeying to Jerusalem. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate, or the narrow gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, and shall not be able. Now, doesn't this remind us of that many are called, but few choose? In Matthew 20, verse 16. Narrow is the way that leads to life. And few, well, in Noah's day, that was only eight souls. But it's a small number. Eight is the number of new beginnings. These few people are what the earth has never seen before. And few there be that find it. When once the master of the, and watch this, some will try to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up and what? Shut to the door. And you begin to stand without and to knock at that door saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence you are. Well, who are these people? Well, let's find out. Then shall they begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence. How many believers have been in charismatic meetings for years and have eaten and drunk of the presence of God? Yeah. But it's done nothing to them. Or they reach some point in their life where they could not make the decision to press in or go on. Yeah. Just because you've been in a charismatic church or just because you've been in a move of God means absolutely nothing. Consider this. A pebble is in a, a river for hundreds of years. But you pull that pebble or rock out of the river. It's all wet on the outside. But crack it open. It's dry and full of dust on the inside. Now, I came forth in the charismatic movement. And uh, I was a disciple and have been forever since I got saved. But I can tell you this. I know thousands of people who have given themselves at one point or another, felt they were called of God, that God wanted to use them. But then God began to get them ready for their calling. God began, to, the only way God does it is through his word. This is it. This is it. You don't just read the word to get revelation. And that's what some of the people that sat under me, they fell into. It's all about revelation. No, it's not. Revelation is married to situation. You don't have something because you can say it Amen. or you know it here. You have it because you're living it. Yeah. So it never got to the point where it affected their daily life. They said, how many times has somebody said to me, oh, Brother Sam, I remember 40 years ago, you were in this meeting. You remember that lady that stood up in the, uh, the night I was leaving or whatever and said, man, Brother Sam, I had a vision from God uh, 40 years ago in a meeting you were doing. Yeah, like she saw the glory cloud. Or something. Yeah, she saw the glory cloud. And I didn't do it, but my temptation to say to her was, where are you now? What are you doing now? It's not what we've done. It's what we're doing right That's now. Right. You cannot dwell on past triumphs. 
Trust me, I could, I could retire right now. I've been all over the world. I've written 80 books. I've, I know I've helped the body of Christ. I've led thousands upon thousands into the glory. I could stop right now and just rest. But I'm not stopping only because there's a very small remnant of men and women that are teaching sound, balanced doctrine. And the thing I've been teaching and preaching for years, get a foundation, get a foundation, get, get under a man of God. Every one of us should have a relationship with the Father in ministry. That is so important. That's right. We met uh, here recently with my father in the Lord, and who has been my pastor for over 50 years. And I'm telling you, I still support him financially. I tithe to him. I, 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 I do what I was taught to do many, many years ago. And I've kept that relationship because God made it known to a 16-year-old kid, a 15-year-old kid, that somehow, some way, that man was very important in my life. Do I agree with everything Brother Dan stands for? Does he agree with everything I stand for? We've had many arguments over the years, disagreements. But when I began to believe in the restitution of all things, I went to him and told him about it. And when I finished telling him about it, I said, well, what do you think? He said, well, I think that was error, what you just told me. Let's go to lunch. Think of that. Mm, yeah. Let's go to lunch. Because he knows I'm his son. He's my father. So I took what he said and then I searched the scriptures and searched the scriptures. Ah, and then when I came back to Brother Dan, maybe a few years later, and said, I still believe in the restitution of all things. And he looked at me and he said, I do too. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Glory Thank to God. You. Thank you. And there's been times when he said things to me and I've had to change my... But I, I wanted that relationship so desperately because I never had an earthly father or an example of one. My earthly father was just a horrible human being. Raped my uh, sisters for years. Beat my mother in my presence until I could physically stop him from doing it. But I knew that man was the man of God for my life. And I'm telling you, when you think about it, it's so easy. Dan and I are just completely different. It's like Mark Hamby and I. We're completely different from one another. But at the same time, the connection is what God is after because in the last days you're not going to be able to be appointed by some uh, uh, what do they call it presbytery it's going to go back to the days of Paul where Paul or somebody's going to have to write letters on your behalf I and this is it I know that man I know that brother see all of that personal relationship has been gone and the greatest attack has been on father and son ministries over the last few years. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, there are men on television that have thousands of people that walk around saying, I'm a son of that ministry. They've never even met the man. Mm -hmm. There's no way you can be a son to a man you've never met. Glory to God. And in my life, many of the sons and daughters that I had 
they would reach a point, as I did so many years ago, you reach a point where there's something you just cannot give up. You've suffered a lot. You've gone through all the dealings of God, but you get to something that, you, oh, I just, try as I might, I just can't give that up. And so they quit. Rather than uh, act like it's decision that they made, they try to blame their fathers in the Lord and blame the people over them in the Lord to justify them. So they can't live with themselves if they don't. When you know in your heart it was your fault, you didn't do it. That's why Paul said the world is not worthy to receive men of God. The things that uh, Father Ministries have to go through is beyond anything you can imagine. But I wouldn't have it any other way. Because when you see your sons and daughters ministering, you hear them with revelation and you see them coming forth leading worship and counseling and prophesying and teaching and ministering to people. Oh my, nothing can ever beat that. Well, let's just go on reading here. When once the master of the house is risen up and he shuts the door. The door to what? The door to everything heavenly. And he begin, you, be, you begin to stand without and to knock on that door. There ain't no way. You know, it's like some people say, well, intercession will break it through. Uh, no, you got to have keys. Yeah. Where there's a door locked, you got to get in. What about the gates of heaven? You got to have keys to get in those gates. And I'm going to show you these keys over the next. What are the keys to the kingdom? Well, they call it the key of David because David was a worshiper. David was a warrior. He was an overcomer. What did the Lord say there in Revelation chapter 3? I've set before you what? An open door. Oh, thank you, Jesus. What happens in the next few verses? In mm. Revelation chapter 4, John says what? A door was opened in heaven. Yeah. I set before you an open door. He just finished talking about who? The overcomers. That's right. Overcomers who are not always overcome in this life, but overcome something, are determined to give their heart and life to overcoming. Oh, thank you. I don't care how many thousands of times, multiple thousands of times, you fall doing the same thing. I've done things thousands of times. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and I'm Lord. telling you, every time the word of the Lord comes and Lord. says, you have my forgiveness, be free. Now get up and start walking again. You keep doing that. If God sees that's in your heart, you know what he's going to do? He's going to cut short that work in righteousness. And what you could not do, in your flesh, God is going to supernaturally give you the ability. Yes, do it, Lord. There's do coming a day when a fountain's going to be open. Thank you, Lord. A blood. What's that for? For sin and uncleanness. Glory. And every sin and unclean Thank thing you. that his people who were trying for years Lord. to quit, in one instance, there's a day when a fountain yes. will flow and all of that will flow to us Thank and we will you. receive grace and strength to overcome like never before. Thank you. But anyway, listen to them. They're, they're, they're banging on the door to get in. They're knocking. Lord, Lord, open to us. And he says, I know you not whence you are. But did he know them? Yes, he knew them. 
But did he know them? It goes back to when it says Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived. This is a deep, intimate knowing of God that only comes through years of Bible study, years of worshiping alone, as well as with the people of God. They said, don't, don't, don't you remember? We've eaten. What does that mean? They ate the word. Living word has been preached. As, I'm telling you, as long as I've been alive, and all the people, Uncle Arthur, Chuck Flynn, Derek Kuhn, Dan Duke, Mark Hamby, Eva Evans, June Lewis, all these people in my past that I know have been preaching. And, you know, Kenneth Hagen, Kenneth Copeland, uh, all these people, Judson Cornwall, have been preaching and giving the word through this charismatic movement that's over and dead now. And we're getting ready for the next great wave of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And it's going to be different from the last one. Different in so many of you say, well, how so? I don't know. But I know this, my heart is excited. Yeah. And I'm ready. I'm so ready for God. I don't want to be one of those, as Uncle Arthur used to say, when the new wave is coming in, the old wave is receding. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be one of those old wave people from the charismatic movement that are trying to hinder the new move. Mm -hmm. So we have to stay open and free and be balanced and watch the witness of the Spirit. Have a relationship with men of God that are older than you. It ain't about control. I don't want to control anybody's life. I've never told anybody what to do in their situation unless they ask me. And if they don't ask me, I'm not going to tell them. Nobody likes to have that kind of, uh, you know, authority in people's lives. Paul said, if God's given us authority, it's for your edification. It's for the building up of people. Not to get all kinds of authority and be domineering and, you know, uh, taking money from people. None of that foolishness. But if they say, we've eaten and we've drunk in your presence. What's that? That's worship. That's the glory. They drunk the glory. How many people do you know and I know that have been in glorious meetings but are no longer in those glorious meetings? Something happened. Yeah. And don't you know that God knows everything? That actually, I'm going to be honest with you when I say this. He created the waster to destroy. He's the author of good and evil. Isaiah said he created it. God uses evil he uses suffering. He uses the hardship of our lives. He even uses leadership, bad leadership, as a way to help bring us forth. I know some of you uh, listening today, Sandra in D.C., I love you, sister. I had such a, I was so blessed by my conversation with you the other day. You're such a tremendous disciple. So many of you all over the world, but you know me. And this is the first house I've ever owned in my life. And God sovereignly open the door. Amen. I mean miracle after miracle. And then when I obey God to come back down to Jacksonville, somebody heard from God to pay the first six months of my apartment. Hallelujah. Don't tell me I'm not supposed to be here. Don't tell me that God's not going to raise up meetings everywhere. 
and I'm going to be appointing my sons and daughters to take over these little meetings because that's what I believe God is doing. Okay. And then at some point we'll all come together, you know, in some kind of uh, general meeting or mass meeting. But there are pastors that are not pastoring. There are teachers that are not teaching. There are worship leaders who are not leading worship because simply there's no place to do it. It's only because of the Babylonian system that we're living under. Amen. Uh, Lord, Lord, Lord. Mm. I didn't even get to Shebna and the Eliakim in Isaiah 22, talking about the key of David. But we'll continue, and I'll, I'll continue with this Tuesday night, but I'm telling you that my heart is burning. Yes. Wow. Not only, I just want to do the will of God before I leave this earth. I want my last days of ministry to be, I, I mean, I, I'm happy to burn myself out. That's right. While others are sleeping and resting, I want to go until I can't go anymore. Because I want to see my fruit, my sons and daughters, actually begin to do the ministry. And I'm not afraid for any of them to be greater than I am. I would hope that would happen. And there's nothing great about me. I can tell you that right now. And many of you that know me know that's true. Hallelujah. But hear me today. Let this word think it over. I mean, well, what does it say about the slothful man roasteth not that which he takes in hunting? You came here hunting this morning and God has given you a great meal to feast over, to, to, to roast over. The slothful man doesn't go over the, the 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 meeting he's been to doesn't go over the scriptures. Glory to God. Bless you, dear sister. The world is open to us now. Yes. And everybody says, "Well, I can't wait till this pandemic's over." Well, neither can I, so I can travel again in the nations. But I'm telling you, God, whether he sent it or not, is none of my business. All I know is God has used it. He's even shut down churches in the United States so people could get an idea of what it would be like without Babylon. Mm -hmm. And every one of us have to make decisions about what we're doing now because the church will never be the same again. Jeez. And I believe this last days, God is going to be raising up millions upon millions of local home fellowships. Yes. And with that, give the some people, and he calls some apostles, prophets, but all the people called to ministry, give them an actual place where they can do their ministry. Mm -hmm. I want it so bad. I know God wants it so bad. And I'm committed to seeing that happen through my life. My wife is committed to seeing it happen. She let me go. She said, you know, I think you ought to do it. I just believe you're supposed to do it. My daughter, the same thing, and I love my family. Yeah. I've been married over 20, 30 years to my wife, 25, 30 years. I forget the date, how many it actually is. But now that my children are grown, it's time. 
Remember what Elisha said to Gehazi, his servant? Is this a time to receive money? Yeah. Is this a time to, uh, as Haggai says, to live in sealed houses and God's house That's right. is not taken care of? Mm. Every one of you that have experienced and know the call of God on your life, I'm going to pray this morning for you that God restore that calling upon your life and that Amen. God begin to show you a way to have it fulfilled. Hallelujah. To restore to you the years that the canker worm and palmer worm have destroyed. Let's stand to our feet in his presence. Glory to Jesus. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Father God. Now, I, I want to say this to those of you uh, that Narrow Way Ministry, now that I've got the property in Asheville and I'm down here, uh, I've not received a dime since I've been here and uh, life has to go on bills have to be paid and so on so if this word has ministered to you and you feel like God has joined you to this charity please I'm asking you sow your seed today I'm looking to start a meeting here or have a meeting and uh in a sense, a welcome back to Jacksonville meeting and tell people what I'm doing. Uh, we're going to have to rent a place for that. And uh, it's going to be at least a three-day set of meetings, morning and evening. And that's going to take money and time. I don't have a vehicle. I'm dependent upon people to pick me up and drive me around. I'm asking you this morning, help me. Let me help you now. Let me just minister this to the Lord. We lift up. Don't sing because I'm going to, I just want you to be quiet before the Lord and let the impact of the glory reach deep down inside of you. We lift up.
make it personal, make it my and I. Lord, you my head. And as I minister to anyone here, I will pray for you all right now. I pray that the spirit of glory and grace rest upon each person. Your anointing flows into their house, into their life right now. few quick things before we close today. First of all, thank you so much for joining us. It means everything to us that God's glory and his word is ministered to you. Please like and subscribe, as well as we'd love to hear from you as well at office at nwmin.org. You can email us. Lastly, check out our website, nwmin.org. We have just so many resources, Bible studies, e-courses, things like that. We just want to make disciples of the nations. Jesus himself said in John 8, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Making God's people free, hallelujah, is the goal as we share this word. To that end, has this video been produced? Lastly, if this video is ministered to you spiritually, pray about sowing a seed to this humble ministry. You can do that online at nwmin.org slash donate. Thanks again. Jesus truly is precious. Bye for now.